and welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. My sinuses are killing me. I'm sniffing all the time. I've got headaches. I, I, I think I've got sinus disease. Or is it just a headache? Or is it the weather? Or is it rainy days are always bringing headaches and sinus disease and sinus symptoms? We'll be answering those questions. My guest is Dr. Mark Overholt. Dr. Mark Overholt is a board certified ear, nose, and throat physician. And he'll be answering our questions. He looks at sinus disease every single day. Hello, I'm Dr. Robert Overholt. I'll be your host for the next 30 minutes on the Dr. Bob Show. And later on, we'll be talking about how taking good care of yourself will take care of your sinuses. So the exercise and the laughter and eating properly all goes along with good health. We'll be learning how that is and what you can do about your sinus problems. We're talking with Dr. Mark Overholt, board certified ear, nose, and throat physician. And we're talking about having bad sinuses, bad nose. I've always got sinus disease. Mark, welcome to the Dr. Bob Show. Thanks for having me back. Hey, how big a problem is sinus disease? One of the biggest medical problems in our country, about 30 million people per year have sinusitis, and it's one of the number one causes people go and seek care from their physician. So the, the financial impact is huge, and the time lost from work and just the misery of patients is a, is a significant issue. So what are the symptoms? If somebody has sinus, can it be a whole lot of different ones? It, it sure can, uh, and the symptoms tend to group together. So people have stuffy noses, runny noses, sneezing, congestion, headache, and, and that could be allergy or it could be viral upper respiratory illness, or in some cases it could be a bacterial sinus infection. So your physician needs to help you kind of navigate which is which. Probably 80% of what people present with in our country when they have sinusitis is a viral illness. Now that's sinusitis. I, I hear a lot of people, sinusitis, and uh, so it's sinusitis, and that means? Inflammation of the sinuses. In fact, the, the term we use more commonly is rhinosinusitis, which includes the paranasal sinuses and the nasal cavity. So how many sinuses do we have? We have four paired sinuses. <laughs> no, so they'd be frontal? Yes. And then? The maxillaries and the cheeks, the ethmoids between the eyes, and then back in the center of the head, there's the sphenoid sinus. So it's way back in the middle of the head. Does it cause much problems? It can. Yeah. Uh, the cheek sinuses, that's what? People normally think of when they say, I've got a sinus infection on one side. Uh, what gives you a hint that it's infection? Uh, it, the timing of the presentation of the patient. You know, usually the patient that has maxillary uh, infectious sinusitis, cheek sinusitis, has had a preceding illness or a preceding allergy attack. And it's you know, seven days later, 10 days later, and they're worsening now. Their congestion is getting worse. They're, they're feeling more fatigued. They may have some pressure in their face. They're beginning to blow out some discolored nasal secretions. Perhaps those are bloody, and they just feel more poorly. So when they wake up in the morning, they feel tired, and, and I just don't feel good, and then they start sniffing and snorting? Sure. Uh, when, do you, when does the patient decide they need to see an ear, nose, and throat doctor? I think most of this is handled um, appropriately by the primary care physicians who are out there. Uh, and, and they're the front line, and they're all well-trained and well-versed on how to manage you know, upper respiratory illnesses because they're so common. Uh, so if a patient has you know, a nasal congestion, runny nose, I think it's probably appropriate to try over-the-counter medications first, try the decongestants. And, and they're getting better and better, the over-the-counter medications. Some of them, I think, however, may harm the patient without the patient knowing it. True. Some decongestants and some medicines that don't let people sleep. And so there's some tricks of the trade. That, sure. that and Afrin is one of those that you're talking about. There, so there are nasal decongestant sprays, and some people will 
default to those medications because they really help acutely. You can use them and a few seconds later you can breathe. The problem is if you use them for a few days, you begin to have a rebound uh, and as the medication wears off, your nose swells tremendously and then often you're worse than you were to begin with. And then the patients progressively use that nasal spray more and more and they get hooked on it. Yeah, it, it, and it's not an addiction like drugs, it's an addiction because your nose is so stuffy and you know the afferent oxymetazoline is there, is there to help. Um, are the over-the-counter medicines, the antihistamines, what are some of those over-the-counter that are good? So there are several non-sedating uh, antihistamines that are out there, fexofenadine, uh, loratadine, cetirizine, and those are all available at almost every pharmacy now over the counter. And, and truthfully, some of the old, those are the new generation non-sedating antihistamines. Uh, the older antihistamines that were, quote, sedating still work great. You know, chlorpheniramine is a wonderful old antihistamine that was, it used to be one of the least sedating of the sedating antihistamines. The old chlorotrimeton. Correct. It's chlorpheniramine. And we still use that. It has, it has a couple of side effects, though, drying of the nose and, and uh, some, other, some other basic problems. Uh, <clears throat> so with that in mind, which ones do you like? I think most everybody starts with the nasal steroid. And, and those the nasal are, steroid. Yeah, now so give me an example of one or two of them. A Flonase is the one over the counter that people see commonly, or Nasacort or Nasonex. Those are common drugs that you see advertised on the television. They come in generic forms as well. Your pharmacist can direct you to those medications in the pharmacy. Uh, and nasal steroids are wonderful medications to help, even if you have a viral upper respiratory illness, where it's not appropriate to be on an antibiotic because antibiotics do not impact the viruses. But a nasal steroid will cut down the inflammation in the nose and give the patient symptomatic relief and often that'll be all they need to get to resolution. I see a lot of patients, Mark, who uh, when you listen to them talk, they've got a nasal toad and, and you know, some of them are football players, you know, they've had a broken nose and, uh, and they're, they're sniffing and snorting and they're miserable and they, they learn to live with it. Why don't they say? You know, relief is just a minute away. It's in the doctor's office. Uh, or they just learn to tolerate it. I think a lot of people tolerate a lot. Yeah. You know, and uh, it's a great time in medicine. We have so many new tools at our disposal to help people that have nasal congestion and runny noses and sinus infections. And the technology continues to get better and better which is great for the patient. You know, there's less suffering for the patient and better impact from their standpoint of, of well-being. Is it easy to diagnose a sinus infection? You've gone through the not allergy, not virus, not this and that. Uh, is it by looking in the nose or are there special x-rays? Tell me about that. So when we start, it's a clinical diagnosis, just as we talked a few minutes ago. The rate, the X-rays that we use, predominantly CT scans of the sinuses. Is CT dangerous? Not at all. No, yeah. the, the common CTs that we use in the office settings now are low uh, impact as far as exposure to radiation compared to you know, older generation CT scans, full body scans that have more radiation exposure. They're very safe. You can do them in the office? M most ENT physicians that I know have their own CT scanners in their office, which is a great convenience for patients. It prevents the patient from missing several days of work. You can get a diagnosis and treatment plan in one visit, uh, which is wonderful. So CT scans we use in people who've had treatment. So somebody who has presented, gotten worse, gotten an antibiotic, been on an appropriate nasal medications to try to treat the nasal congestion, we see them back and then we use a CT to say, hey, is it better or is it looking like it's going to be prolonged. And you can tell that by looking at the CT scan. You can say, you can tell by looking at the inside of the head uh, what the sinuses really look like. Yeah, the CTs are unbelievably sensitive. Yeah, and so uh, I can't imagine how people practiced uh, medicine in, in the old days. Is there direct visualization that you can have? Can you look in the nose with instruments? to verify where the infection also is, sort of double check? Sure. 
uh, and we do that commonly. That's nasal endoscopy. And so nasal endoscopy, and that's what we're going to be talking about. It's first time I get to interrupt my son here without him <laughs> beating on my chest. A nasal endoscopy, what is it? How good is it? What can it tell the doctor? And then we will look at some of the newer methods of treating sinus disease that to me are so amazing. You'll want to stay tuned. We're talking with Dr. Mark Overholt, board certified ear, nose and throat specialist. We've talked about sinus problems, sinus disease, about the diagnosis, about over-the-counter medications, which are really, really good. And the primary care physician takes really excellent care of people that have sinus disease. And now we're going to be talking about, well, what if the patient just doesn't get better? And what does the ear, nose and throat specialist do? So Mark, patient's been, had good medicines, good care and everything like that, and they're still miserable takeover. Start with a CT scan to try to define the areas in the sinuses where we have a problem. And then, you know, we figure out how we address that area. If it's a maxillary sinus, sometimes a little balloon dilatation of the sinus opening will help. Balloon dilatation. Now, what are you talking about? I'll talk about that in just a minute. <laughs> um, if it's in the ethmoid sinuses, then sometimes we have to go in and clean out the little honeycomb spaces in the ethmoid. And the frontal sinuses over the brow can be... Uh, expanded with the balloon as well, as can the sphenoid. So we have different tools that we use and the tools help us address different areas. And so I brought along an example of one of the tools we use, and this is a, a sinus balloon. Uh, it's actually a really neat one. It it's, it's, can be hooked to a computer and when the, the little wire is extended out of the balloon, the wire goes to a computer which tells the computer where the tip of this wire is in the person's sinuses. and then. Once we pass that wire into the sinus cavity, and we're looking with a telescope in the nose, so we, we know where it is, and this is an image guidance uh, that the computer is helping us with, and once we get the wire in the right place, then we can advance the balloon over the wire and expand the balloon, inflate it. Uh, and you we, leave it in there? No, we take it out, so it's a good question, though. People ask that. So, so we inflate does, the balloon. What and, does it do when you inflate the balloon? The balloon inflates to a diameter of six or seven millimeters, and it expands the opening. Uh, in the, the cheek sinuses, it's wonderful because the bone that kind of covers the cheek sinus is very thin and it eggshells that bone, which expands it and opens up the sort of siphon or funnel or drainage pathway for the cheek sinus. And when that little bony area heals, it stents the area open, if you will. So uh, I remember when it first came, we really weren't too sure how long is it going to last, two years, or is that, how, long does, how long does that opening, the new opening that you've created? For so, so. It, it looks like it's as durable as traditional sinus surgery. Wow. Yeah, so wow. it lasts just like it. And, and this balloon uh, can also be guided into the frontal sinus. It's a really wonderful tool in that area. I think it's uh, got great application there. That's an area that was traditionally very hard for us to operate in because it was almost beyond our area of visualization. But with image guidance, using the CT scan to create a three-dimensional model of the head, and then using that three-dimensional model uh, to correspond to the wire that comes out of the end of this balloon, we can slip right into the frontal sinus, slip the balloon up in that area, and open the frontal sinus. Same thing with the sphenoid sinus, which is the one that's way back in the center of the head. So do you have to do that in a specialized uh, operating room, or do you... What type of setting and how do you prepare the patient? We certainly do the uh, balloon work in the operating We use it as a tool in the operating room, um, but it's being used more and more in the office setting. And we're doing more and more traditional sinus surgery, even if we have to clean out the ethmoid cavities in the office with either sedation or no sedation and just local anesthesia. It's really amazing how much patients tolerate uh, without discomfort. Uh, and it's you know, if, if you can do it without discomfort and you can avoid a general anesthesia, wow. it's safer for your patient. Wow. And so we selectively choose those people, but it's, that's a changing um, scenario in ENT. Yeah. Uh, to me, that's, you mean you don't have to go under general anesthesia and fix it and come out? And sometimes there are problems with general anesthesia. People have a hard time really waking up. It takes them a little bit of time. So you can do that in the office 
Now, do you normally squirt some lidocaine up in the nose? Yeah, I guess everybody has a different protocol. But most of us will spray somebody's nose with a misting spray of an anesthetic and then take some medication and saturate some little cotton pieces, if you will, uh -huh. and put them up where the sinus opening is. And those cotton pieces really uh, get good anesthesia. The doctor could inject a little bit of lidocaine once there's topical anesthesia so that the patient feels nothing. And um, you can completely anesthetize the nose so that the patient will let you do the operation under local successfully. You know, sometimes anxiety of the patient is really the only prohibitive factor. If the patient just doesn't like the idea of having something done while they're awake, then, then anesthesia is an option. And it's safe, and people do well with it, and it's... Uh, wow. So, so if you do it in the office with the balloon surgery, uh, can they go home that day? Sure. Is they need some, somebody to drive them home, I hope. You know, if it's done in the operating room under general anesthesia, of yeah. course, you have to have somebody to drive you home legally. Uh, but if it's done in the office, a lot of what we do, people will drive themselves home. If, it's, if you add sedation to the procedure, then you need a driver. Uh, your doctor will talk to you about that. But for, in many cases, people can drive themselves in and drive themselves home following the procedure. And that lasts how long? Putting a little balloon up there and then deflating it? How long will that last frequently? Um, you know, it's as durable as a regular surgery, so it's indefinite. It should be forever. Now, is it, life is what it is. Nothing sure, is forever, but sure. um, it, it is potentially forever. Yeah, and that's interesting. In a way, it's just like uh, when you're putting a balloon into a vessel in the heart, you open up that vessel and it stays open for a period of time. Uh, to me, that's especially walk in and walk out. So what else do you have here? That fascinates me. So once you've had an operation, then the key is how do you keep the person from having recurrence of their infection? And a lot of people will come see me and say, I had an operation. Uh, it didn't, I'm, I'm still the same as I was before. And if I look in their nose, the, the person before me, whoever it was at the operation, did a beautiful job. And it wasn't the surgery. It was the patient's underlying allergy or immune system or whatever. And so we use medications to try to make the nose as calm as it can be. And we have lots of new things that are out there. This is a really unique uh, device. This little uh, basket at the end is a polymer. Uh, it's dissolvable. That's a plastic, isn't it? It's polymer? Sort of, yeah. It's a, dissol <laughs> it's a dissolvable plastic. And this one will dissolve over three months. And as it dissolves, it leaks a topical steroid into the place where it's implanted. So it delivers steroid to the tissue without the patient having to take an oral steroid that might give them side effects. So uh, that's it's like putting a cortisone cream on a rash. You know, it, it's, it, if done properly, it's not dangerous at all. And so this puts small amounts of a steroid, they call it eluding, that comes out there. Uh, Mometazone is the one. That's the steroid that comes in this particular device, yes. And they, they, they come in different forms. Some of the little stents last for a month and dissolve. And this one lasts for three or four months. And... You know, beyond this, we have new drugs that are being administered that help us modify the biology of the patient to prevent them from making polyps and get their inflammation out. And it has been remarkable uh, to see the patients that were once chronically suffering despite a physicians' best efforts to manage them now be disease-free and live a normal life. So I'm going to want to spend just a little bit of time talking about what the word biologic does for ENT, and also if the people that don't seem to have allergies, don't have viruses, don't have infection, don't have anything, but they got a runny nose like mad, and it just won't get better. And even the medications for the run just don't get better. Uh, you've got another new device. I, you, you, you ENT guys are amazing. You want to stay tuned? A lot more information for you to get your nose better. We're talking with Dr. Mark Overholt. We're talking about sinus disease. We're talking about there's great medicines over the counter. The primary care physician does a great job of taking care of it. Sometimes people end up needing to have some surgery. 
we talked about the new surgery, which is balloon sinuplasty. It means you, with an instrument that's guided, you can dilate up with the balloon the sinus drainage area, and it stays open like that. I would think it would just collapse right back. Absolutely amazing. Now, let's talk about somebody that needs even additional help. You were talking about putting something in the nose that elutes um, the steroid medication. Correct. So we talked about the Sinuva implant. and Sinuva and, implant. Yeah, that's the company that makes this particular one. And it's, uh, this is the, th the implant that stays in the sinus for three or four months and, and leaks out the steroid to keep the inflammation from coming back. Is it, does it irritate the nose? Not really. It can cause some crusting. Some people will have a, uh, a little crusting in the area. We'll have them use some, some saline or salt water irrigation to wash the nose to, while this is in so that the crusting doesn't become an issue. When you take that out, uh, or does it just dissolve away? Uh, it, it dissolves and becomes soft. It's very easy to get out once it's at the end of its lifespan. So what is the patient's perception of their nose when you take it out? Does it immediately, immediately clog up or they say, gosh, I'm so glad I did that? Well, it's great while it's in because it's leaking the steroid. And you would think that once you withdraw the stent that the patient would return to their baseline. but my experience has been different. My experience has been that there's a, a lasting effect that comes from these implants that gives people prolonged benefit. And so if somebody has sinus polyps and has had an operation, and in the past when the polyps come back, we'd have to operate on them again. Now we can uh, slip a, a little stent in there to melt the polyps away. And you might have to do that once a year or twice a year, but it uh, sure beats surgery if you can get away from it. You mentioned in the last segment that there is a new type of medicine that we can take that also really works against the disease process, the underlying. What, what's that called? So that, we're talking about biologics. Biologics. Yeah, and those are medications that modify the immune system or block pathways in the inflammatory response. So when somebody gets challenged with something and they have a tendency to develop inflammation, and perhaps sinus polyps, there are certain chemicals that the body produces that lead to that response. And if we block the production of those chemicals with drugs, then we can calm the process down and prevent the polyps from coming. Or for the asthmatic patient that has the same kind of chemical trigger, we can back down the asthmatic response. And those are wonderful new medications, and there are new ones every week, it seems like. And more and more other avenues of medicines also use these biologics. Cancer treatment, uh, GI disease, uh, rheumatology. Almost all people now have biologics that are changing medicine. It's just not like it was back in the old days, yeah. <laughs> uh, which I think is so wonderful to practice medicine now because there's so much more that you can do people. Okay, I want to spend some time on the constant runny nose. I've been to so many doctors, my nose still just runs, and I just have to r wipe it all the time, and it's embarrassing to me, and my wife doesn't want me to blow my nose when we're out eating. Now, it's not me personally, uh, <laughs> but that scenario, with that in mind, what's going on? Why does the nose just run sometimes? Nothing else, just runs. Yeah, it's not necessarily allergic. It's a, it's a neurotransmitter is a it's a chemical that the body makes that um, just turns the nose on and, and usually in life we're able to send a selective signal to the GI system to get prepared for digestion or a selective signal to the nose to run if we want to shed pollen that's gotten in our nose but sometimes that signal becomes nonspecific and for people who eat that neurotransmitter can stimulate the nose to run and so people will say you know, Doc, I'm dripping in my soup. It's embarrassing. You've got to help me. <laughs> and there are drugs that block that chemical that the body makes. Uh, one is called ipratropium, and it's a really good medication to help in the, that setting. And antihistamines help, too. But there are a lot of people uh, who you give all the medications to, and they just don't get better. And there's hope. What's, what's the newest and the best? So there are two ways. So there's a nerve in the back of the nose. 
it's called the posterior nasal nerve. It's way posterior back. Posterior nasal nerve. Right. It's way back in the back of the nose on the outside wall. And that nerve, we think, plays in the role of, the, of rhinorrhea or a runny nose. And we can stun that nerve or knock that nerve down with either a balloon filled with liquid nitrogen that's held up against where that nerve lives, or this is just another technology that does the similar thing. This is a radio frequency wand, and uh, under you put an endoscope in the nose under local anesthesia like we described, and put this device up where that nerve lives in the back of the nose, and the radio frequency generates heat. So either cold or heat is the tool that we're using to stun that nerve that sends the signal to make the nose run. And it, it, if it works perfectly, is a miraculous procedure. Yeah, and <clears throat> miracles do happen. That runny nose can just stop. Mark, we needed to talk another three days. Thank you for coming to the Dr. Bob. You're a great, great teacher, and I always love having you on the show. It's my pleasure. Thank you for having me. Wow. Now, remember those four things. We can't go without mentioning those. Exercise. Exercise helps the whole body be better. Eat properly, eat less fatty foods, get seven and a half hours sleep, get rested, you'll perform well. And most of all, have that laughter, you'll stay healthy.